introduce you in two minutes at to our time. And yeah, we're getting everything logged on. Good. People will probably start to come in soon. Live stream is good. Um, time. Forget, forget, forget. Okay, we've got like two minutes left until we start. We'll start. It. So, who are you guys? Oh, my name is Zane, and this is. I'm Emma. <laughs> nice Zane, to meet Zane you. And Emma. <laughs> <laughs> has this been fun for you all so far? It has been. Yeah, we've well, done a bunch of them today. Are you feeling a little uh, webinar out? <laughs> It's fun. I like it. <laughs> yeah, you're getting people from all over the world. That's so cool. Yeah. We heard about snow leopards, rhinos, turtles, the Great Lakes, amphibians. and amphibians. Oh, wow. Wow. You heard about the Great Lakes, and now you're going to hear about some great apes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, that's good. <laughs> Well, and other and other species. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There's like two people on right now. Well, there's also people on the live stream. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll okay. get started. Here we go. <clears throat> Hello, guys. Welcome to the MBTI. Thank you all for joining our webinar today. We have Deborah Curtin and Laura Barr from the New England Primate Conservancy. We're going to talk about some apes today. Please put any questions in the chat box, not the Q&A session. Okay, guys, you can take it away. Okay, thanks so much. And thank you for inviting us to participate in this webinar today. We're really excited about it. And we hope that we're going to um, have some fun as well as provide a lot of information. So we have a cute presentation that we developed especially for you. It's not cute, it's really informative. But, and so here we, here we go. At New England Primate Conservancy, we believe that if we're kind to animals, we're more likely to be kind to one another. And here's the lay of the land today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about New England Primate Conservancy, tell you a little bit about what we do. We're not gonna spend a lot of time there. We're mostly gonna talk about primate conservation. And when we do that, we'll hopefully in introduce you to some species that you've never heard of before. We're going to show you some habitats that you probably have no idea that they live in. And then we're going to move on to what you can do to help to protect them and their habitats and all of conservation, in fact. So let's go. So who we are, New England Primate Conservancy is an animal protection and wildlife conservation organization that makes its greatest impact through education. We're driven by a commitment to leave a legacy of hope and tools to leave a better tomorrow for all this, the Earth's citizens. We're a trusted resource recognized globally for our expertise in animal protection and conservation and we reach millions of people annually via our website and social media platforms. And we'll tell you about our social media platforms later so that you can follow us. Also, we have unique lessons and activities targeted for grades K to 12. And Laura will be talking about those because she is our education content director. And our, our lessons and activities contain teaching points and learning goals that facilitate use in the classroom, at home, and in hybrid situations. And some of them you'll just want to do because they're fun. We're also a global resource for all of these organizations and more, and for individuals, and mo most importantly to us, for students and educators from elementary through university and beyond. <clears throat> and one of our goals is we like to make science fun. We don't want it to be daunting. We want you to have some fun with it because education is the heart of animal protection for the animals, for you, and for the future. Let's get started with primate conservation. We're gonna talk about who and what are primates, where primates live, 
and why primate conservation is important. So who are primates? This is what most people think of when they think of primates. They think of the charismatic species. And on this slide, there are only two monkeys, but people refer to all of them as monkeys, and that is incorrect. So across the top, we have an orangutan, which is a great ape, a lemur, which is a prosimian, a gorilla, which is a great ape, down bottom, a chimpanzee, which is a great ape, then the next two are monkeys, the mandrill, the gorgeous mandrill, the largest of all monkeys, and the capuchin, which most people know. But here's the reality. There are 522 primate species, 704 combined species and subspecies made up of great apes, small apes, monkeys, and prosimians. And we'll explain what prosimians are in just a little while. Let's look at the great apes. So great apes are Usually now, for the past some years now, considered the tool users, but all primates use tools and almost all animals use tools as well. Great apes are bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, humans, and orangutans. These are our closest relatives, the bonobos and the chimpanzees. Bonobos are very peaceful, chimpanzees, not so much. Humans, of course, are great apes. And then we've got the orangutans and the gorillas. Orangutans are primarily arboreal. That means that they primarily live in trees and gorillas are primarily terrestrial living on the ground. Orangutans are solitary. Gorillas are, they live in large family groups. So one of the things I'd like you to notice as we go through all of these groupings is how different they all look. The differences in their appearance are because of their roles in biodiversity. They each have a role to preserve their habitat and a role for how they use their habitat and their physical appearance is it dictates that. So then we have the small apes, which are the gibbons, and they tend to travel via brachiation. They have specialized shoulder uh, joints so that they can swing through the forest and they can reach speeds of up to 35 miles an hour. They sing to announce their territory. And if you look at the white-cheeked gibbon over here, you can see that the males are black with white cheeks. The females are a buff color. That's called being sexually dichromatic. That means that they're different colors based on their sexes. You can see the lar gibbon. I wish, you could, I wish we could give you a recording of gibbon singing. It's spectacular. Next grouping is the monkeys of Africa. And many of them have cheek pouches so that they go and find their food, they eat it, uh, I'm sorry, they stuff their cheek pouches and they take it elsewhere where it's safe to go and eat. Many of them have what are called nicely sitting pads. They're pads, thick pads on their butts so that it's comfortable for them to sit on tree limbs or on rocks or whatever they prefer to sit. Most of them have opposable thumbs. Uh, those are thumbs like ours, opposable thumbs. Um, I tend to think that the black crested mangabe may have been Dr. Seuss's uh, inspiration for the Grinch. You look them up on our website and you take a look at some of the close up pictures and you might agree with me. The mandrel down bottom, look at how different they all look. Mandrel down bottom is the largest primate, the largest monkey in the world, as we already said. Over here, also in Africa, is the smallest of the Euro, the Afro-European monkeys, the talipoin. And then we'll talk about multi-chambered stomachs in a little while. The Gares, a colobus monkey has a multi-chambered stomach. That's unusual, you would think, for a primate. So take a look at all of these guys and let's move on to the monkeys of Asia. Once again, many have cheek pouches, many have sitting pads, most have opposable thumbs. Then you've got the proboscis over here on the left. Look at that nose, huge nose to amplify calls. And also they have webbed toes for swimming. They live in marshes or, or mangrove forests. And sometimes they need to get away from predators and they can jump into the water and swim better than most other monkeys. And a lot of monkeys enjoy swimming in the water. By comparison, let's take a look at the golden snub nose monkey underneath who has a tiny little nub of a nose and that's because they live high in the mountains where it's very, very cold. And it is assumed that the reason that they have these tiny little noses is to prevent frostbite. 
And then just you know, taking a look at some of the other gorgeous species that we have here. Um, this crested black mangabe has a great hairdo, so sort of a mohawk kind of thing going on. And hardly a tail at all. Com compared with gray langurs, you're going to see in a future picture, remember this when you see the picture of the monkey on the motorcycle, that these guys have incredibly long tails. And then there's the spectacled langur over here. Well, they're actually dusky langurs, called spectacled langurs also because they look like they're wearing glasses. And their infants are born bright orange, which is common among langurs. The assumption being that it's so that all of the all of the family can see where the babies are at all times. Now we've got the monkeys of the Americas, only from Latin America, from Southern Mexico into Central America, into South America. We've got howler monkeys, which are the loudest land animals. Their calls can be heard up to three miles away. We've got tamarind monkeys. How do you love it? like that mustache on the tamarind? We've got tamarind monkeys, and this is not the only kind of tamarind. There are a whole bunch of tamarind species, but they have claws and they're the only ones, the only monkeys that have claws rather than flat fingernails like we have, tamarinds and um, marmosets. Then we've got bald wakari is one of my favorites. I didn't even put any information because you can just look at this and see how different he is from everybody else. The night monkey, also called owl monkeys because of their large eyes, the only nocturnal primate, uh, monkey, I'm sorry, the only monkey that is active at night. Spider monkeys have don't have thumbs or have little nubs of thumbs. And that's because like gibbons, they swing through the forest and thumbs would get in the way. And then we've got the smallest monkey of them all, the pygmy marmoset. And you're familiar with capuchins. Again, I just want you to notice again that, that how different they all look one from the other. Now we're at prosimians. So what are prosimians? Prosimians are the most primitive of all primates. Prosimian literally means before monkey, but they're still primates. Some of them are nocturnal, some of them are diurnal, that means they're active during the day. They all have wet noses, that's the prosimians of Africa, they all have wet noses. Now take a look at how different they all look, only two of them are from the mainland of Africa, the pato in the lower right corner, and then the galago, which is also called a bush baby. Those are the only two, everyone else is from Madagascar, everyone else is a lemur. Again, look at how different they look from each other. And we and here, this is a mouse lemur over here on the left. This is not a Madame Bertha's mouse lemur. Madame Bertha's mouse lemur is even smaller than this one, and they're the smallest of all primates. And I put a little thing on here about uh, a fun fact: ringtail lemurs have stink bites. They have <laughs> they have glands in their arms that have an odor that we can't smell, but they put they put it on their tails and they have fights. They, the males do this, they fling the odor at each other. Then there's the prosimians of Asia. There were just two sorts. There are tarsiers and lorises. Very interestingly, lorises have a toxic bite. So they have a gland in their arm that they can activate. And when they lick it and it combines with their saliva, they have now their they have now a toxic bite and they can do great harm to a lot of species. They can cause huge problems for um, us humans if they were to bite us. So they're adorable. I mean, look at how cute. And it, it's to their detriment that they're this cute because people capture them for the pet trade. They're slow, they are adorable, they're nocturnal, and they should never be pets as no primate should ever be pets and they carry a toxic bite. Tarsiers, different than all the other primates, have dry noses. So, not, I'm sorry, not all the other primates, all the other prosimians, pardon me. They have dry noses. So that caused a new classification of some primates as having wet noses versus dry noses. And there's controversy about whether or not they should even be called prosimians, except everything about them is looks like a prosimian. And you know what, they don't care what we call them. They really just want us to leave them alone. So that's an overview of who all of our primate cousins are. Let's look at where they live. And we're going to start with this video on where primates live, just to give you the visual. So here's a map of the world. 
Here's the equator. And you can see where primates live and just as importantly, where they don't live naturally. Okay, this is, these are the continents they belong in. We've taken some liberties in this, in that, for example, um, primates don't live in far into South, Southern South America, but we wanted to get as many pictures in as possible. All monkeys in South America, no non-human great apes in South America. Now we go to Africa, a huge continent where there's tremendous diversity. Once again, we took some artistic liberties here because there's some, some desert in there that, the, that they can't live in, like the Sahara Desert. There's not enough water. There's um, no plants. There's nothing to eat. But there's great apes, monkeys, and prosimians, and the prosimians all in Madagascar. And then South Asia, we can see tremendous uh, variety of, um, of non-human primates as well. We probably went a little bit further north here, but they do live quite a ways north, up into Japan, up into the Himalayas, and in some of the mountains in China. Now here's some important information. Human primates live on every continent. As our populations increase worldwide, we're at over 8 billion people. Non-human primate populations decrease because we take up their land. And this ultimately puts us all in peril. And we're going to talk about why that's the case in just a few minutes. But it's important to note that protecting their habitats saves and protects us all. So we talked about the continents that they live in. Now let's talk about habitats. You can see a great diversity of habitats in this picture right here. Most people think that all non-human primates live in tropical rainforests, and indeed, most do. But let's, but let's talk about where other primates live as well. The Hamadreus baboons and some others live in semi-arid deserts. They can't live in full-on deserts, as I said a few moments ago, but semi-arid deserts, you can see in the background, there's some greenery back there. And that they, these particular baboons live in the Horn of Africa, and there are some even on the Arabian Peninsula. Then we've got uh, the um, geladas that live on these steep, grassy cliffs. Notice this grass, how dried out it is. This is their food. This is what they eat. And these are large monkeys. If you've ever seen geladas anywhere, they're large monkeys. They have to eat for 10 hours a day in order to gain enough nutrition on these, these grassy cliffs. But mother and nature intended them to be there and to be able to digest this. There are a number of species that live on savannas. This patas monkey happens to live on the savanna in Africa. Really interesting um, monkeys, very long arms and legs, not built for climbing. They do a little bit of climbing, but they're not really built for climbing. And they can run. They are the fastest of the primate land animals. They can run at 35 miles an hour. Now here's our friend, the proboscis again, we already talked about the, him. And there are a number of species that live in swamps and in mangrove forests. And there are some that live in snowy mountains like this Japanese macaque. And this is not a posed picture. Somebody didn't hand this monkey a snowball. This is something that they enjoy doing. Just like you enjoy making snowballs, they enjoy making snowballs. They throw them at each other, they play in the snow. And then when they want to get warm, they go and, and soak themselves in warm thermal springs. Then there are some that live on riverbanks and seashores. These long-tailed macaques have a nickname, which is crab-eating macaques. And I think you can guess why, because they eat crabs. And they use tools. I mentioned tool use. They use rocks to break open those crabs. You'll see us mention long-tailed macaques a few times because they are an extremely adaptable and diverse species. And sadly, even though they're as adaptable and diverse as they are, they are endangered. In the center here, you see that some monkeys live on rocky cliffs and in caves. Look at how sharp those rocks are. These are Katba langurs. They live on Katba Island in Vietnam, and there are only 65 of them left, not because of the severity of their environment, but because they've been hunted to near extinction. And if you've ever seen um, Disney's movie, uh, Monkey Kingdom, I believe it's called, that, that movie was all about toke langurs. 
They're called they're called toque langurs. I'm um, sorry, toque macaques. They're called toque macaques because of the swirl of hair on the tops of their heads. It looks like a hat that's called a toque. And they live on Sri Lanka. And a lot of them live in the sacred temples on Sri Lanka. And they're often referred to as sacred monkeys because of that. And I've spent it, I've used this whole slide to talk about those who live in urban settings. I understand in a couple of weeks, you're gonna have somebody come and talk to you about human, non-human primate conflict in Asia. And here you get an idea of why this might occur. This is another long-tailed macaque living in a city and probably stole that sandwich from somebody. These are very intelligent animals who know that where there's humans, there is food. So they know how to break in. They've got hands like we have, and they, they break into places and they grab food. Also, you can see power lines up there. They tend to become electrocuted from those power lines. That's another problem in cities. This gorgeous gray langur I mentioned before here, you can see the tail I was talking about. If you follow my cursor here, this tail goes round and round and still, oh, pardon me, still goes down further. Cute. I think they're beautiful. But the guy whose motorcycle that this one is sitting on may not think they're as beautiful as I think. And then we've got baboons who are very large monkeys with very large canine teeth. And they will raid trash barrels. And what people really need to be doing in these areas is locking their barrels like we need to do for bears. They need to lock them because you don't want to mess with a baboon. You don't want to mess with any of these monkeys. They're fast. They have very sharp teeth. They're very, they're brilliant, and you just don't want to get into any kind of a any kind of a tussle with any of them. Let's talk about why primate conservation is important. One of the things that I like to say is that biodiversity is Mother Nature's formula for success. And that's because each ecosystem is home to exactly the right number, combination, and diversity of plants and animals to create beautiful interdependent relationships that allow it to flourish. Biodiversity, when left to its own devices, keeps the earth and her creatures living and thriving with plenty of resources for everybody. So the role of non-human primates in this is as their habitats nurture them, they nurture their habitats as well. So we have, as we've already seen, lots of different primate species with different adaptations. These are sake monkeys here. This is all the same species. These are white-faced sake monkeys this difference in appearance between this male up top and the female and her baby is that is called sexual dimorphism. Again, you'll see this a lot among primates where males and females look different. They live far up in the canopy, like really high up in the canopy. And they have access to a variety of fruits that some animals don't. So while they're up there eating, they drop food. Primates are notoriously messy. They drop food they drop seeds. When they drop the seeds, there's an opportunity for that seed to take root, especially if they drop it far away from the mother tree. That, that can then take root and that's what regrows the forest. But also other animals that are down on the ground have the opportunity now to eat foods from the canopy that they wouldn't be able to. And I'm not just talking about primates here. I'm talking about lots of other types of animals that could eat the, those foods. Some primates are pollinators. Let's look at this black and white rough lemur over here. Look at the long snout and that snout can fit right into a flower. And then there's hair around. This is why it's called a rough lemur is this, this hair that's around the face gets covered in pollen. They move on to the next tree and the pollen is dispersed into the next tree. Lots of leaf eating monkeys and they stimulate new leaf growth. You know, if you take leaves off of a plant, it encourages that plant to grow new leaves. Some of them are insectivores, they eat insects and that controls insect populations. And as I mentioned, notoriously messy, very often hooved animals will follow primates so that they can get whatever foods because they, they obviously can't climb trees. So they get foods that they, that they wouldn't ordinarily have access to just by following monkeys around. Deborah, I'm just going to jump in for a second. Yes. Um, yeah. Paul, I see a lot of hands. I see hands raising and, and things in the chat. We're going to get to those hands and those chats. Just put the questions that you have in the chat box. 
Okay. And that's actually probably better than the hand raising just for audio purposes. So go ahead and just write your questions and then we will get to them. Um, I promise. We yes, love yes. questions. So yes. we'll get there. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Laura. Okay. So primates are built for success. All right. As most animals are built for success there again, I'm going to say this over and over again, they are physically adapted to benefit their ecosystems. So this Thomas's leaf monkey here, like all leaf monkeys, has a multi-chambered stomach and they can digest toxic plants or other plants that are difficult for other animals to digest. So this gives them resources that aren't available to other animals because they can digest them. Some of, some of them, like our um, Tarsier friend here, is physically adapted to forage at night. And because of its specialized ears, which don't have hair and have little ridges in them, I don't know if you can see it, sound echoes in their ears and they can grasp flying insects right out of the air. They don't even have to be able to see them. Interesting about their eyes, their eyes are fixed in their head. They're so large, their eyes are large or as large as are larger than their brain and, so, and fixed in their head. So they can turn their heads like owls. So these, these adaptations reduce competition for food sources. This is so important about why primates look so different and behave so differently within their habitats because it reduces, it, it, um, reduces competition for food sources. So the number, variety, diversity, and physical adaptations, both those you can see and those you can't see may absolutely astound you. There are indicator species of the health of their environment. As their habitats are destroyed, primates lose their homes and the resources necessary for their survival. If they're at risk, so too is every other species in their habitat. So I've put pri all primate species on here, but consider all of the other thousands of species with whom they share their habitat. If they're in trouble, so are they. So then we get to the human primates, that's us guys and our interference in biodiversity. When habitats are overly exploited, slashed, burned, fragmented, and otherwise destroyed, native animals lose their food sources, their hiding places, and their homes, and mother nature becomes unhappy. Without endemic animals, endemic animals are those that are native to a certain type of environment. Without endemic, endemic animals to provide crucial activities that they're built for, like enriching and fertilizing the soil through the course of their daily activities, environmental balance is disrupted. And then there's global impact. Depletion of forest affects air quality globally. Fewer trees produce less oxygen, putting all of us oxygen dependent organisms at risk. Less oxygen results in more carbon, which warms the atmosphere and less and uh, habitat loss affects the entire world, not just one region. So just take a look at this video. 70% of primate species are threatened. That means that they're vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. 43% are endangered or critically endangered. 100% are threatened by human activities. What are those activities? Wildlife trade, slash and burn agriculture, clear cutting forests for cattle grazing, hunting for bushmeat pelts and body parts. But there's hope. What we humans have caused can be repaired, reversed, and prevented because we caused it. It starts with the choices that we make every day. And we're going to start to talk about those choices right now. So what can you do? First thing you can do is you can learn. And you can learn about the many diverse primate species, where in the world they naturally live, what habitat types they require, what they need to thrive, survive, and produce future generations. Their futures depend upon the survival of the ecosystems that nurture and support them and that they nurture in return. Where can you learn? Guess where? On, oh, pardon me, on our website. And if you'd like at this point, if you've got another window open and you'd like to follow along with us in a moment, we're going to show you some how to navigate some uh, portions of our website. So it's www.anyprimateconservancy.org. Our first menu item on the website is primate conservation. If you click on that, it will give you some overview of primate conservation. Then there's drop downs for primate facts, primates and animal studies, and primate conservation is limelight, which we'll talk about in a little while. Very importantly, 
the, the backbone of all of our programs is our primate species profiles. We have profiled over 330 primate species and we write them in everyday non-scientific language so that the greatest number of people can understand how our fellow primates behave within their habitats, what they need to behave within their habitats and can understand what's lost if these animals become extinct. They're written in, in a comprehensive way so that we've done the research, we've gone to multiple sources and we put it, all of the information in one place. And so to all, a lot of the questions that I'm seeing in the chats about these different types of primates, you can see on our primate species profiles. So the questions to a lot of those, the answers to a lot of those questions are where Deborah is showing you right now. Okay. So you can see the second menu item. Thanks, Laura. This is, this is what our homepage looks like on the website. And so if, if the second menu item up there is primate profiles, and you'll see the drop down menu that shows you the different categories of primates and the different locations of where they live. So if, you not, if you're not sure what kind of primate you wanna look up, you click primate profiles up there and it brings you to this page. And here you can see a listing of different types of primates. So say you decide, huh, monkeys of Africa looks interesting. I wanna know about colobus monkeys. Click on colobus monkeys and it brings you to what we call the genus page and the primates are listed alphabetically by their common names. And you can see we scroll down here, then here's another colobus monkey genus. Here's another colobus monkey genus. We don't have all of them on here. And if you go back to, pardon me, if you go back to and you decide you want to learn about the Angolan colobus, you click there and it brings you to the primate species profile page. Every primate species profile page begins with a graphic with quick facts about the species. And then you scroll down and you'll see that we have content about geographic distribution, stuff about their taxonomy, which that's there's always controversy about what species, what group they belong in. So we let you know what's going on there. You get the map. And then all of these categories here are what we write about. You get three different photos because we also want you to see when males and females look different, when babies and adults look different, we want you to see that. And you get all of this, and this is consistent throughout every primate po profile. The information is in the same order. So you can just go to another profile and look up, maybe you wanna know about communication. You can scroll down to communication and find that information. So and if you, uh, uh, Deborah, there was another question that the website yes. is neprimateconservancy.org. So NE, like New England, primateconservancy.org. And that's how, where you can go to follow along. Okay. And yeah, and we're almost going to get out of this section anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so I just want to show you an alternate way to look for primates. Also, we want to make you successful. Like the primates are all built to be successful. We want to make you successful in learning about these primates. And we want you all to be able to be primate conservationists. So another way that you can find them is you can go to primates at a glance. Once again, there's this drop down menu. Do you want to know about primates? You know, do you want to know about the apes of Africa? Do you want to know about Asian prosimians? But let's say you want to know about um, African monkeys. So you click on African monkeys and um, you get a page similar to this that shows you a slideshow. Now, this starts with the Chakma baboon because it's alphabetical and it either forwards automatically or you can click arrows front and back, or you can fast forward along the bottom. You can go through and determine which species you wanna know about. And when you find out which one you wanna know about, you click on that and you click on that and um, it brings you to the primate profile. We also do a video for every species, 30 second video, quick facts, and we post these daily on social media. We, have, we, we do one primate profile every day on social media. We use these in lessons and activities and, and we use them on our, well, they all appear on our um, YouTube channel. So we've profiled 300, over 330 primates. We have created over 330 of these videos, which you can enjoy on our YouTube channel, as I said. And once again, we're on social media. 
So we'd love for you to follow us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. Considering Snapchat, need to learn a little bit more about it. But once again, every day we post about, we post primate profiles. We feature a new primate species every day. We post any new lessons and activities, any new program announcements, any fun stuff we find out about non-human primates, we post on our social media platform. So please do follow us. And we're going to now move on to our lessons and activities. And Laura is going to talk about that. And education is the heart of animal protection and wildlife conservation. So take it away, Laura. Hi, so it's nice to see you all. I'm excited to see all the questions in the chat. Please continue putting those questions there. The hand raising is, um, is we're probably not gonna call them a hand raising just because of audio issues. So just, just put your questions in the chat and we'll get to that. Um, my name is Laura Barr. I, I do a lot of different things, but one of the things I do is I am an educator and I have taught all sorts of different classes, but I came to New England Primate Conservancy in 2019 because I was so deeply troubled by how I work in education, but I felt that what I was educating about was not what students really needed to know. And what students really needed to know is about how to protect their resources, the natural resources that we have, and to be able to continue to live on this planet in a way that um, can be sustainable and to protect other species, which I consider the greatest uh, luxury, the greatest richness that we have is other species. They are our friends, not that our friends that we wanna keep as pets, but looking around us and having diversity is what makes us ha happy and healthy and makes life worth living. So, uh, so I came to New England Primate Conservancy and I work to create and curate and inspire um, educational content for the classroom. So here's a list of our, of our lessons and activities that you can find. And if you're a student, you can direct your teachers to these. And if you're a teacher, uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to all sorts of lessons and activities that are pre-made for you to use in your classroom. So we have, this is where it is on the menu of the website. Let's keep going. So uh, we have STEM and STEAM-based project-based lessons. I love projects. Projects are the, the way I learn. So uh, they're what I, uh, we have inspired. So they work across many academic disciplines. And um, if you're an educator, we have uh, the objectives that they meet, the STEAM and STEM, and um, educator pages and project samples. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so this is my own, cre uh, my partner and I created this. This is called The Case of the Disappearing Habitat. I love detective stories. So one of the questions I saw in the chat was, um, what's happening to, to the primates? What's happening? And how are we connected to this? So this is the, um, and I'm gonna put on my detective hat. I know it's super <laughs> cheesy. <laughs> Thanks. <Sarah. laughs> um, so uh, we did some investigating and in this project, you investigate how products that you buy, um, things like shampoos and lotions, and most importantly, for those of us who are, um, who like the sweets, candy is linked to rainforest destruction. So in the case of the disappearing habitat, we talk about different candy and um, we have a five stepped project where we put together um, a lovely uh, final presentation called the candy culprit. I make my students do this all the time and it's always awesome. So, uh, so this is our um, case of dis the disappearing habitat. If you're a teacher, uh, this is something that we will help you adapt for a one week, a two week, or even a two day type of project based lesson. Super cool. There and there are five videos like that one. Yes. It's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have the conservation. This is a scavenger hunt. Really cool. But these are our conservation themed 
um, activities and lessons. We have the alphabet soup of conservation. Maybe you didn't know about the IUCN and all the different um, labels that you have for endangered or critically endangered or what the difference of that means. This will tell you. And then we have scavenger hunts and we have a really cool Prezi called Life in the World's Tropical Rainforest. So these are all on our website, all really fun to do. Okay, and then we have primate themed lessons and activities like become a primate pro sort of I love the title of this Deborah. <laughs> so uh, in this you'll learn about um, 10 of the most well known primate species 10 of the weirdest 10 of the most endangered and 10 that you've probably never heard of. So um, this is a really fun uh, activity and then there's um, color me chimpanzees we'll talk a little bit more about that primates and their habitats and where primates live. These are all things you could do in your classroom. And you can see the video where, from Where Primates Live. You can see that on, on there. And uh, it's got music and animal sounds, which we can't show you here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you're a little older, if you're in high school, if you're, you know, let's say a sophomore, a junior, or a senior, um, we have this You're the Scientist um, series. And if you're younger and into this sort of thing, you can do it as well, but it's more for older students. And basically there are things like creating a dichotomous key where you'll identify tamarin and or lemur species. And then you have something where you create an evolutionary family tree, how to create a phylogenetic, there's a word, phylogenetic tree. And this is a diagram that depicts the line of evolutionary descent of species. And then this is a series we're still developing. It's very in depth and it's super cool. What is nature? Sometimes we say nature and we don't even know. What does that mean? Well, in this series, we talk, we get, we get down in the dirt, <laughs> literally. So we do teach you how to even create your own pollinator garden at your own, um, at your school or at home, or if you live in an apartment, there are things that all of us can do no matter who you are, no matter where you live. Um, to inspire more nature in your life. And um, this is something that's really important and I, I'm gonna hit on this again. Conservation works, it's successful. So my goal is for all of you to become conservationists. All of you to start thinking about how do I protect the earth's natural resources? How do I inspire myself and the people around me to get closer to nature? It will make you happier, it will make you healthier, and it will make your life more rich and meaningful. Okay, and then this is just a fun activity, um, Color Me Chimpanzee, created by one of our um, educators who uh, works with, um, it's called, you know how green screen works? So she knows all of these things about different faces and green screening, and um, she's created these pages for, uh, for coloring activities, which, I, I'm an adult, I still enjoy it, lots of adults do. <laughs> and there's also um, primates in their habitats. We're gonna see a little bit more about those decks. On our website, a free resource for you, you can download um, a, a card deck on cardstock. Um, and then we have Prezi's and slideshows. Yeah, and so here's the cardstock. Beautiful, beautiful pictures, free to you. You just, um, you can print it on cardstock and you have all of these different games that you can play. Uh, with primates in their habitats and learn more about them. Some of the questions that you all are asking right now about different primates on these cards. And then if you are an educator, if you are a teacher, um, please participate in our educators blog. Um, write to us at info at anyprimateconservancy.org. We have currently educators who talk about um, project-based learning and how that's successful. We talk about school gardens. The idea is for educators to share their experiences teaching conservation in the classroom. And then what can you do? There's so much that you can do. Everyone can do something. So talk to your family members, teachers, and friends about conservation, animal, animal protection, and habitat preservation. It's really important for us to network and share what we know. Um, be creative and have fun with it. Create a video, slideshow, or other media art forms. This is part of some of the different activities that we do as well. Um, one of the things uh, I had my students do with the candy culprit is they all created these really cool memes. Um, anyway. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, whatever it is that you do that is um, 
your way of being creative, you can bring that into conservation. Um, Deborah, one of the questions that um, we'll get to was about how you uh, got started in this field. And I will share with you, you know, I didn't start off as a conservationist. I did not start off knowing these things about primates. This is something that I came to because I felt that something was missing and I needed to figure out what I could do to help. So I'm gonna take it from here because we have some other videos and, and they're listed under the um, education uh, menu in our, in, uh, on the website. And so number three of what you can do is to act. And we have three videos that we've created. One is about personal choices. One is using media. One is in your community. Each of these videos has three brief suggestions for what you can do. They're empowering solutions, ideas of what you can do to be a conservationist. And we're not just talking about primate conservation here, because in order to save primates, we need to save the planet. That's bottom line. So everybody can do something. And your daily choices affect habitats thousands of miles away. Right now, we're gonna show you the personal choices video. Once again, you're not hearing the music because it messes up the audio. But if you look at it on our website, there's nice music. So what everybody everywhere can do for animals in the environment, part one is personal choices. Easier than you might think. Millions of people adjusting their daily habits in small ways create big changes. Remember more than 8 billion humans on the planet. So three simple steps, try one, two, or all three. The first thing, consider your dietary habits. Now why? Modifying your dietary choices is the easiest way to positively impact our environment. <clears throat> Beef production uses 50 times more land as rice, potato, and wheat production combined, making it one of the least efficient uses of resources on our planet. Forests are burned and cleared for cattle, cattle grazing. This eliminates oxygen producing trees. We all know how important that is. If you reduce the amount of beef you eat by as little as one quarter, you can make a big environmental impact. So that's maybe once or twice a week. Read product labels and avoid palm oil. Why do we want to avoid palm oil? Lush forest homes are intentionally burned to the ground <clears throat> to develop oil palm plantations that cannot sustain wildlife. Orangutans are critically endangered because their habitats are disappearing at an alarming rate. They could become extinct in your lifetime. Your purchasing choices could determine their fates. Third point, support animal free entertainment. We don't want more captive animals. We want them to live in their habitats. Acrobatic feats inspire awe and wonder in all of us. We humans can be very entertaining. Wild animals are meant to live like this, free, and not like this, caged. So if we reduce demand, fewer, fewer wild animals will suffer in captivity. So consider your dietary habitat, uh, habits, read product labels, support animal-free entertainment. Three simple suggestions. And what footprints will your choices leave? Here's the good news. And we always love to deliver good news. Because most habitat destruction is due to human activity, it's preventable, repairable, and reversible. We cause it, we can fix it. Don't sit back and wait for someone else to do something. You can be the change that you hope for. What else can you do? So people always wanna know what they can do. We've always got something else you can do. Consider your purchasing and consumption habits. We, especially in the United States, are among the largest consumers in the world. Be aware of where products come from, how they're processed, and their impact on habitats, including climate change. The future is dependent upon the survival of ecosystems that nurture and support biodiversity, oxygen-producing trees, and stable climate. There is no planet B. Let's take care of our planet. Don't worry about going to other planets. We're meant to take care of this one. And there's more. You can become a conservation biologist, an anthropologist. There's a list here. You can Google it and look it up. I know people who do each of these things. And he, here we talked about the conservationist limelight. I'm gonna speed up a little bit here because we're getting tight on and we wanna be able to get to your um, questions. But in conservationist limelight, we interview the people that we consider to be 
the heroes, the primate heroes, on the forefront of saving primate species and their habitats. We introduce them, their work, their hopes and dreams to you. Um, this guy is a primate illustrator. This is uh, an illustration that he did of what is called Stephen Nash's TT monkey. It's named after him for his great work. So each of these people are specialized in their in their um, uh, in in the primates that they rescue or that they advocate for. And be sure to read these; they're wonderful. More that you can do now. Somebody asked, well, "How did I get into this?" I don't have a science background. I have a background in marketing and sales and management in a number of industries. And I got to a point in life where I said, "I've got to do something for the planet." I've got to, and I chose non-human primates because they're our cousins, because we're primates. So 20 years ago, I founded, non, I founded New England Primate Conservancy so that we can do our part to raise awareness about what needs to be done. And once again, I know people who do all of these things that do it for conservation. Laura, what is it you love to say? I love to say none of us can do everything, but all of us can do something. And as my students are really tired of me saying, we need people who care. We really need people who care in this world. Be a person who cares. And, care remember, and, and, and anything that you do is better than nothing. And remember millions of people adjusting their daily habits in small ways create big environmental differences. You don't have to do something dramatic. You don't have to do what I did and change your whole life and get into a different career. But you can do small things to, to have great impact. One final thought. This is about mountain gorillas. And mountain gorillas live in Africa. You know that. They are surrounded, their, their habitats are surrounded by human settlements. They have long been subjected to poaching, civil unrest, and, and diseases from humans. Populations were down to 480 individuals by 2010. Here's the good news. Thanks to intense conservation efforts, their populations are now almost at 1,100. There's still work to do, they're still endangered, but very importantly, conservation works. So the future's in ha your hands, what will you do? So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start um, asking these questions, Deborah, that I'm seeing in the chat, and I'm gonna um, send them to you, but I wanna start with one. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna start with Kenyans, question. Um, Kenyon's question said, how long did this presentation take to make? And I want to just, uh, I, I want to start with that question because um, Deborah created this entire thing. Um, it's gorgeous and it's beautiful and, and tell them how long it took you to make it. Uh, three months. <laughs> <laughs> so she has worked incredibly hard on creating this gorgeous presentation for you today. Um, it has, you know, it has been a real labor of love and um, it's, it's, I am so wowed by her skills as a graphic designer, um, but I wanted to start with Kenyon's question because yeah, you, you've been at it for a while. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, I've been working on it very hard for a while and I designed this specifically for this audience. Yeah. So this is for you. Um, the next question I wanted to ask, so, so Anthony asked, um, what's the biggest species? So I'm, let's, let's say that that's what's the biggest primate species. The Grower's gorilla is the largest primate. They're huge, very, very endangered, critically endangered species. Once again, they are, they're really huge. They're like pushing 500 pounds. They're, they're gigantic. And, they're, and they are gentle as can be. Where do they live? They live in Central Africa, around Congo. Um, Miller asked this question, and this is a really good question because this is uh, this kind of gets back into the, the what you can do. It says, can people have monkeys as pets? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is that in most places it's illegal to have monkeys as pets. And why do you not want to have monkeys as pets? They need to be with their families. We can't give them what they need. They're, they're really fast, they are really smart, and by fast, I mean they're faster than us. I've been around non-human primates. Okay, one time I was at a chimpanzee sanctuary and some stuff fell out of my purse. And by the time it took me to process that my purse had toppled over and that things had fallen out of it, 
One of the chimps had already run downstairs, put his arm under the, the caging that's there and grabbed all my stuff. And we actually had to barter with him <laughs> to, get my, to get my stuff back. We, had, we got some pudding and some ice pops and we bartered with him and he, he gave me my stuff back. But they're so fast. They're stronger than we are. Even the smaller monkeys, they're stronger than we are. They're faster than we are. And they're miserable as pets. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise, please. They are absolutely miserable as pets. We don't have enough time for me to tell you more about it, but please trust me, we don't want them as pets. We want to see them in their natural habitats where they belong with their families. Their families are important. One other point about being pets is that in order to get a baby primate away from its mother, you have to kill the mother. That's the only way that that's done. In the case of chimpanzees, for one baby chimpanzee, 10, 10 adults are killed because the, the parents will come to rescue that baby. So will the aunts and uncles. So will the neighbors, just like humans, just like humans. So please keep that in mind. And, and that doesn't mean that um, you won't see people who have them as pets or you won't see that that does that, you know, or that's what the, the, the illegal pet trade is. People do still kidnap these animals and trade them as pets. So it does happen, but um, it, is a, it is a terrible fate for that animal. Um, but the, I, I do understand it's like, oh, it's like so cute. But as, as Deborah said, you know, um, all of us want to be happy and free. Yeah. They're cute um, until they become teenagers, just like humans. They're cute until they become teenagers and they fight back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you imagine, if you can imagine when you slam your door at your mother, but you have canine teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Sh Shanna has a really good question. She says, are there any primate species that help out other primate species? And I, there, I'm thinking you're meaning besides us. <laughs> there, we have there, are, there are actually, there are some, there are actually quite a few where the species will live close to each other because some of them have calls that will alert everybody else to danger or there are some that can get to certain foods that can help others out. We have to sort of give you the quick question, the quick answers now, but yes, there are quite a few that help each other out. And in a lot of species, there are young monkeys or young apes that play together. In some cases, chimpanzees and monkeys, you know, the, young, the youngsters will play together. So, so yes, and sometimes orangutans and gibbons play together. So yes, the answer is yes. So um, there's, there's two questions here I want to get to, but, but Kenyon just asked another excellent question, which is, um, are there primates, what are some primates that are extinct? Um, there, there was a giant lemur that is now extinct. Um, I don't know too many of the others that are actually extinct. I know some, I know many that are close to extinction. There is a gibbon called the Hainan gibbon in China. There are only about 30 of them left. There are a few, there are a few species where there's 20, 20 monkeys left. It's mostly th the monkeys. Um, I believe I'd have to look up what species, well, you can look up what primate species are extinct, but I, I deal with the living primates and trying to save those that are really close to extinction. And we have so many of those, mm -hmm. we have so many of those. And that's one of the things that, um, has been all our call to trying to help primates. Um, right. And then Jordan says, and I know you won't have a, won't have one, but uh, what is your favorite primate species? That's always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's always a problem. And that's like um, asking a parent who their favorite child is. <laughs> um, not to say that some parents don't have a favorite child, but, 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 <laughs> but um, it's hard to say because there were so many I love spider monkeys because even though they have these bulbous bellies and long, long arms, they, um, they're so graceful in every movement that they make. I love gorillas. How can you not love gorillas? They're just, they're magnificent and gentle vegetarians. How can you not love them? There are so many species that every time I read about another species, I say, oh, that's my favorite. 
Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I started doing primate species profiles and every every primate I profiled was my new favorite. <laughs> um, OK, Science for Our Future asks, how does the toxic bite work? Is it their saliva that's to toxic? It's a combination of the, so the saliva and the um, uh, what what they excrete from this gland. So there's there's something that they excrete from the gland. It's in there. You can't see. I'm doing this on my arm. It's up near their elbow. And if you, what they'll do is when they feel threatened, they throw their arms out, and that activates the glands that start to ooze some serum. They lick it, and they actually have like grooves in their teeth. And then this goes up into their teeth. And when they bite you, they're injecting you with that toxin. Another thing that they do is they'll also cover their babies with it. If they need to leave their babies, they'll lick the babies and, co and cover them with it. So that, that they're, they're, so they are then toxic. So I think we're done, sorry. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. Thank um, you. Yeah, everything went really well. And most is, it, is there a way that we can try to answer some of these questions? Oh, uh, I think I think we got a good we got a good smattering of them. Okay. Most of the most of the kids that were in here too that asked those um, left the Zoom already, unfortunately, because their yeah. school ended at two thirty. Yeah, yeah, but, but we, we got we were, but Deborah, we were that we got boring. A... We were that boring that they left. <laughs> no, they just won't get their questions. <laughs> their school ended <laughs> no one's that exciting <laughs> there's no one in the world they're going really to stand past the same he was question. some of them were very excited we had yeah, a the, there was the, deborah there was probably like there was one person who just kept raising their hand again and again and again kenyon thank you going. thank you kenyon great questions <laughs> we just had one really quick announcement um, yeah. So one of our partners is Earth Echo International, and they're currently doing a challenge, a STEM competition for students grade five through nine. And there's lots of prizes and information. And if anybody is interested in that, just go ahead and give us an email and we'll send you stuff on that. And yeah, so thank you so much for coming. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you having for us. Having May you all be conservationists. Bye. Bye. Bye.